If you take your Bibles tonight and turn with me to the Nehemiah chapter number 13. And when you find Nehemiah 13, we'll keep our finger there and then we'll make our way over to one New Testament passage, uh, the book of Jude. It's one chapter book right before you get to the book of Revelation and uh, keep your finger in Nehemiah 13 and turn over to Jude and we'll read verse number 3 there and it'll be our starting place and we'll go from there. The Bible says in Jude and verse number 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. There's a phrase here in verse number 3 that he is exhorting us that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. What are Christian people to do? We are to earnestly contend for the faith. What's that mean? Earnest. Now, earnestness means I'm serious about this. Earnest means I mean business. Earnestness is a aggressive approach. We are to earnestly contend for the faith. What does it mean to contend? The word contend literally means to struggle. To struggle. We are to earnestly contend for the faith. Uh, we are to struggle if necessary to make certain that the faith, the word of God, a passion for the word of God, the work of Christ remains pure and holy and right. We're to struggle if necessary to make sure that the message of the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, continues from generation to generation. God's people are called to earnestly contend for the faith. It's my job to contend for the faith. It's your job to contend for the faith. It's the old people's job and the young people's job to contend for the faith. We're to earnestly contend for the faith. When we come to Nehemiah chapter number 13, a great work has been accomplished by God's people under the leadership of Nehemiah. But I'll have you know something, that the work is not concluded. And the work is going to require contending. The work is going to require a leader. The work is going to require some people who say, you know what? We are going to go against the trends and tide of human nature. And we're going to stand up for God and His glory. Nehemiah chapter number 13, we meet up with Nehemiah contending for the faith. A little context, Nehemiah has been gone for one year. He goes back to King Artaxerxes, he set everything up. The walls are rebuilt, the temple's back in service. It's an amazing thing that's happened, to God be the glory. But in one year's time, while Nehemiah is gone, you won't believe this, but some very not good things have began to happen again among God's people. And when Nehemiah comes back in town, chapter 13 is the record of Nehemiah contending for the faith. I'd like to read to you this chapter, beginning in verse 1, Nehemiah chapter 13. The Bible says this, On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber, the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offering, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priest. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem, for in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil 
that Eliashib did for Tobiah. I'm going to stop there just a moment so you can, maybe uh, if you missed the emphasis of what's going on here. Nehemiah is gone for one year. When he gets back to town, he hears of something that is absolutely mind-blowing. Do you remember the name Tobiah? We met up with Tobiah very early on in the book of Nehemiah because Tobiah was one of the guys that ardently opposed Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, I think maybe one time that I called Tobiah a bum or uh, some other bad names. He was, if you come up with a bad name, Tobiah was one. He was, he was scum. He was awful. And in this setting, we find out that not only is he a bum, scum, he's a leech. Because guess what's happened? In the year's time, while Nehemiah is gone, Eliashib, the priest, has made a place inside the temple, a big room, an apartment for Tobiah. And that bum has moved in. Can you imagine how Nehemiah must have felt when... Tobiah, he finds out that Tobiah is squatting in the temple. And Eliashib has allowed it. If you think he's not happy, you're right. Let's see what he does. The Bible says in verse number 7, I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with meat offering and frankincense. So Nehemiah cast him out and all of his stuff. Way to go, Nehemiah. The Bible says in verse 10, And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe, the corn, and the new wine, and the oil under the treasuries. And I made treasures over the treasuries. Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and the Levites, Padiah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God, and for the offices thereof. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do? And profane the Sabbath day. Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon the city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath? And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath and I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and Moab. 
And their children spake half in the speak of, speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elias, of the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priest and the Levites, every one in his business. And for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God, for good. Three times, verse number 11, the Bible says, then contended I with the rulers. Verse number 17, Nehemiah says, Then I contended with the nobles. In verse 25, the Bible says, And I contended with them and cursed them and smote them, certain of them, and plucked off their hair. He contended. Nehemiah was a contender. Now, when Nehemiah had been gone for one year, he came home and much to his dismay, he found some things in great disarray. The first thing he met was the situation with Eliashib and Tobiah. And Tobiah, that leech, was living in the temple of God that could not stand and it must be contended against. The second thing he came to was he noticed that the Levites and the singers, if you remember in our study through the book of Nov. Uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah made sure that there were offerings taken faithfully and things were done right so that the Levites who managed the work of the temple and the sacrifices and the, the work of God and, and kept the faith the Levites and the singers they were provided for and folks were to give certain things at certain times in order that all those things would work but the Levites and the singers the people that were taking care of the house of God and the worship of God they were being neglected and Nehemiah noticed that the singers and the Levites had gone back to their fields and they were growing crops just trying to feed their faces and Nehemiah said something's got to change and Nehemiah contended he comes back after a year and he sees on the Sabbath that God had told the Jews to keep holy he saw on the Sabbath that the Sabbath was being profaned. The Sabbath was a day of rest. The Sabbath was a day sanctified and set apart for the Lord. Holy. And the Gentiles and the Jews were trading on the Sabbath day. And Nehemiah, with great courage, contended to keep the Sabbath holy. Stop that foolishness. Nehemiah was a contender. Finally, there were groups of Jews marrying Moabites and Ammonites. Two tribes of people that God had plainly said that we were not to marry. And when he heard the children talking, I think it's kind of interesting. He said that the children couldn't uh, speak in the language of the Jews. They spake in the tongue of Ammon partly. They spoke partly in the tongue of Jews and they had this mixed language. They spoke a little bit of each. It's kind of fun to hear children that are being taught to be bilingual. They'll say one sentence with two languages in it. It's kind of fun. That's not bad. But in this setting, 
Nehemiah saw that as a testimony that God's people had disobeyed God and it was the beginning of the demise of the work of the Lord. And when Nehemiah came home to Jerusalem after being gone for a year, unfortunately, Nehemiah didn't have the opportunity to kick back, relax, and Enjoy the fruits of his labor. Nehemiah was met with the urgent need for somebody to earnestly contend for the faith. Can I tell you tonight that today we need groups of people We need individuals with boldness and courage. We need preachers to be raised up out of the midst. Folks who say, with God's help, I will contend for the faith. With God's help, I will stand up for what's right. With with God's help, I'll be bold. With God's help, I'll be the kind of person that's willing to struggle if necessary for something as important as the gospel work. I'm so thankful for Nehemiah. When I think about his life and I think about his burden, I think, may God raise him out of among us a great group of Nehemiahs who, like Nehemiah, will see the work that needs to be accomplished, who, like Nehemiah, will wisely, methodically, graciously, Boldly and full of the Spirit of God, strike out to do the work that God has called them to do. And may God raise up among us folks with intestinal fortitude to stand up, be counted, used for the glory of God. And we need people with courage. We need people with backbone we need Christians who say count me in in the spirit of Christ I'll stand for the glory of God I will earnestly contend for the faith Nehemiah comes home after a year I wonder if he was disappointed I think that he probably was but it didn't cause him to throw up his hands and quit He continued in the work, and he earnestly contended for the faith. There's four things in four sections of this chapter that I want to share with you. The first is this. Number one, he contended for separation from the world. He contended for separation from the world. The first part of this chapter, the verses 1 through 9, we meet up with Eliashib and Tobiah. Eliashib and Tobiah. Eliashib was the priest, and Eliashib the priest should have known better, but the Bible says in verse 4 that Eliashib, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Now, this is terrible. Tobiah, if we were to take the time to go through and look at all the different things that Tobiah had done to Nehemiah and threatened the work of God, How foolish it is to come to a place where you think somehow that you should harbor a Tobiah in God's house and God's work. But I want you to know something. Don't look for the devil in the bars on Saturday night. You should look for the devil in the church house on Sunday morning. I'll have you know that the devil's number one method to corrupt the work of God is to infiltrate the work of God. I've been sick at my stomach. I watched a video this week of a denominational conference that happened just a couple weeks ago. In the denominational conference, all the different delegates for the conference were identifying themselves. These are pastors and preachers representing congregations of churches and a denomination. And every person was encouraged to stand and identify themselves by their name, their preferred pronouns, their gender preferences. 
and the congregation that they represented. I watched this and in disgust. And then I watch it in pity. And it breaks my heart. They represent congregations of people that have people that we love. People from Jesus died for. And it breaks my heart. But it brings me to a place that I'm reminded that in one year's time, Tobiah the leech had began to live, literally live in the temple of God. And I'm reminded of how quick a church like ours could go right down the tubes if we neglect to contend for the faith. May God help us to boldly preach the word with compassion and love, but preach the word. I'll have you know that God is right. God's word is right. Let all men be liars and God right. Stand for the truth. You see, Nehemiah contended for separation from the world. Tobiah, the Ammonite, the noted enemy people of the people of God, had infiltrated the house of God, the place of worship. And may God help us to understand that the devil wants in the meeting and leadership of churches like ours, may God help us to contend for separation from the world. Oh, I love Nehemiah's response. The Bible says in verse number 8, and it grieved me sore. I think it's important that God's people are grieved when sin is destroying the work of the Lord. It grieved me sore. And then what did Nehemiah do? He's like, there's just nothing I can do. Oh, no. You know what Nehemiah did? Verse 8, it grieved me sore. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. I love that verse. I've underlined it. I want to put exclamation points around it because I can just see it. Nehemiah said, I'm going to tell you something. This may make a bunch of people mad, but I don't care because I'm here to please you, Lord. And he says four times in this passage, remember me, Lord. Remember my works. Remember me, Lord. The whole time Nehemiah is contending for the faith, his burden is to please the Lord. And Nehemiah goes into the room where Tobiah's stuff was, and he just begins to throw it out in the, out in the road. Yes. Yes. Get him. I like it. The Bible doesn't say that he was mean or nasty, but he contended for the faith. He contended for separation from the world. I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers. And thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering. And the frankincense. He cast them out. He said, clean this filthy mess. He said, I'm going to restore this place to do the work of the Lord. Go get them, Nehemiah. He contended for the separation from the world. I'm thankful for Nehemiah. You know something that keeps coming to my mind as I think about Nehemiah in this passage of Scripture? You know what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah did and used the influence that he had in order to contend for the faith. Some of you think, that's fine. If Tobiah shows up, I will cast him out. But what am I supposed to do now? I'll have you know. You should use the influence that you have at this moment in your life in order to contend for the faith. What influence has the Lord given you? What influence he's trusted you with, you use it. Earnestly contend for the faith. They contended for separation from the world. Number two, they contended for supporting the work. Nehemiah contended for supporting the work of the Lord. The Bible says in verse number 10, we change gears. The Bible says, I perceive that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. It, Nehemiah said, nobody's told me anything about this, but I began to kind of put together the pieces that the Levites weren't being paid like they were supposed to. 
four, the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. What was going on? The singers and the Levites who were supposed to be supported by God's people, who were the folks who serving God's house, they weren't getting supported. And so the Levites did what they had to do in order to feed themselves and feed their families. And they fled to their fields. And Nehemiah said, this is not going to stand under my watch. The Bible says in verse 11, Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. I like that phrase. Have you ever been put in your place? I've been put in my place a few times and deserved it. And Nehemiah, he set them in their place. He said, Look, I'm putting you in your place. You're going to have to do what's right. The Bible says, verse 12, then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn, the new wine, the oil under the treasuries. Now, this is something that fascinates me. When somebody like Nehemiah just stood up for what was right, the end result was a large group of people did what was right. Do you know what we need? We need folks who say, I'll lead the way. I'll be bold enough to say this is what needs to be done. This is what needs to happen. By the way, If God places a leader in your life, have the courage and faith and the wherewithal to submit to the leadership and follow the Lord and do what God leads you to do. It's important. Nehemiah said, whoa, you need to be in your place, taking up the offering, emphasizing the things we've promised God we'd do. We got to support the Levites and the singers. The work of the Lord must continue. And he earnestly continued for supporting the work of the the Lord. I love to watch Nehemiah. The end result was the offerings were taken. The Levites and singers were supported. And the work of the Lord continued. We should earnestly contend for supporting the work of the Lord. Number three, Nehemiah contended for sanctifying the work. The next thing that comes up in this text is The profaning of the Sabbath. Now, this is interesting. This is not the Pharisees trying to keep the Sabbath and trying to keep Jesus from doing good on on the Sabbath day. These were the Jewish people doing exactly what God had asked them to do on the Sabbath. They weren't to trade and buy and sell. They They weren't to do certain work and certain labors on the Sabbath. They were set, the the Sabbath was set up as a day of rest, and a Sabbath was set up as a day that was sanctified and set apart to the Lord. Now The Sabbath just became any other day during the year's time that Nehemiah was there, was gone. When he came, he saw some things happening. The Bible says in verse 15, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine, grapes, and figs and all manner of burdens. They were just working on the Sabbath day like any other day which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And here's what Nehemiah does. Look what he says in verse 15. I testified against them in the day wherein they sold vittles. What did he do? He testified against them. He said, whoa, that ain't right. Have you ever been around somebody that was bold to speak up? Sometimes that's good and Sometimes it feels bad. Have you been around somebody that most of the time when they speak up, they're right, but you wish they wouldn't speak up sometimes? Sometimes parents do that. Some of you kids may have a parent that there are certain things you want to do, but that parent is courageous and bold enough to speak up. And often they speak up and they're right again. I think it's important that God brings people into your life that will speak up when you do the wrong thing. And Nehemiah said, look, we're going to stop all this profaning of the Sabbath. God has set the Sabbath up for us. We've, it's God's law. It's God's way. It's what God wants. And we're going to keep the Sabbath holy. And he spoke up. He testified against them. Verse 16, there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then, verse 17, I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? He says, You can't do this. We've got to stop it. 
Verse 18, did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? He said, look, this is where our mess started the last time the walls of Jerusalem were, came crashing down. We left God out. We didn't sanctify ourselves to God. We didn't set ourselves apart. We didn't keep ourselves holy. This is where it began. We didn't honor God. We didn't honor the Lord's day. We didn't honor and keep holy what God has commanded us to keep holy. He said, we've been here before. Have you lost your mind? In verse 19, it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded the gates should be shut. He said, that's fine. We're going to fix this. Nehemiah said, I know what to do. We can keep the Gentiles out and keep them from trading. We won't, we'll close the gates from the evening until the whole Sabbath is passed. He shut the gates and charged that they should not open them until after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. He said, he said, I closed the door. He said, but they lodged outside. They tried to circumvent the gates being closed. He said, but let me tell you what else, what I did next. There was a group of people who said, we'll show you, Nehemiah. We're just going to camp out outside the gates, and we, won't, we don't care if you close them or not. We're going to do what we want to do anyway. Verse 21, look what Nehemiah does. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. Nehemiah said, look, we're not putting up with this. And you know what? Nehemiah had the reputation. If Nehemiah says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. I like this biblical way to issue a threat. Don't make me lay hands on you. <laughs> I will lay hands on you. Nehemiah says, you do it one more time, and I will lay hands on you. And how sweet it is to watch somebody contend for the sanctifying of the work of the Lord. Nehemiah said, I'm not going to put up with this. Now, I'm not calling anybody to be mean. If you know me at all, you know that's not my spirit. And if you know Jesus at all, more important than me, if you know Jesus at all, you know that's not his spirit. When the time comes that the money changers' tables need to be turned over, by all means, turn them over. And Nehemiah earnestly contended. For the sanctifying of the work. He said we're not going to be profaning the Sabbath. Not while I'm in town. And finally. Number four. He earnestly contended for saving the work. He earnestly contended for saving the work. Verses 23 through 31. Bring it in a, a, a section of scripture. That can be contentious and worrisome. We, we come here where the Jewish people. And God has forbidden the Jews from marrying Two groups of people. Some folks want to say the Jews have, have, have refused and, and commanded through God's authority that they do not marry two other races of people. I think you make a mistake if you make this a racial issue. Now, this is not a racial issue as much as it is. I should say it's not a racial issue at all. It is a spiritual issue. The, the, the Bible principle is... This race should not marry that race. The, that's not the Bible principle. The Bible principle is that we're, to be un, we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And the burden that God's people had was not that you were marrying somebody of a different race, but the burden that God had for his people and keeping his people pure and holy, it's the same burden that God has today, that God does not want you to marry somebody who's not a born-again Christian. God does not want you to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Oh, how many times have we watched folks fall in love, in quotation marks, with somebody who's not saved, with high hopes of their love winning through. But I'm going to tell you something. Rarely does that ever turn out good. And most of the time it turns out 
horrible. And some of you even here tonight in your own families are dealing with the heartache of that type of foolish decision. The issue was that the Jewish people, the Jewish men, they were attracted to the Moabites. They were attracted to the Ammonites. They were attracted to these people that God had commanded they should not marry. On a side note, there's one wonderful story in the Bible where some folks did the wrong thing and left Jerusalem and went to Moab. Some Jewish boys married some Moabitess girls. and One of the Moabitess girls that came out of Moab to Israel, her name was Ruth. And it's a beautiful story of the grace of God. By the way, if you've blown it and made a terrible mistake and you are unequally yoked, let me tell you something. It's your problem is not bigger than the grace and mercy and blessing of God. Don't lose hope. But God said, look, I can help prevent a lot of this mess. If you'll just listen to me. Have you found out? If I'll just listen to God, he can prevent a whole lot of mess in my life. But the Jewish men had began to marry the Ammonites and the Moabites. The mixed marriages, the mixed faith was a great problem. Because you know what happens? When you mix the faith, the faith is diluted. And the future of faith in Christ soon fades away. It's a sad thing to watch. Families gradually fade away from the faith. It's a sad thing to watch heritages that once were rich in the grace of God and faith in Christ fade off. And the Lord says we're going to try to prevent that. We want to prevent the work of the Lord from ceasing from generation to generation. And the way I want to do it is you can't be married. There's Ammonites and Moabites. Don't do it. The Bible says in verse 23, In those days I also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod of Ammon and Moab. And their children spake half in the speak of speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. They spoke in the language of both groups. He says, and I contended with them and cursed them. and smote. I don't think he used bad words and cursed them. I think he cursed them as you have doomed yourself. You have doomed yourself. I cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God saying, you shall not give your daughters unto their sons nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. And he gives them a little lesson from the Bible. Verse 26, he says, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? He said, Solomon did the same thing. Solomon welcomed in women from pagan lands to be his wives. Yet among many nations was there no king like him. Solomon, he says, Solomon was awesome. Not only was Solomon awesome, no king like him. He said, the Bible says, but he, who was beloved of God. And God made him king over all Israel. Now we're talking about somebody really special. Would you agree? Solomon was really special. And Nehemiah said, look, Solomon, as awesome as Solomon was, he says, nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. He said, let me tell you something. If they messed up Solomon, they're surely going to mess up you. And with great boldness, with great boldness, Nehemiah contends for saving the work. He calls them out. He says, we're not going to do this. We're not going to deal with this. We're not going to live like this. I'm not going to allow it. I'm going to use what influence I've got to contend earnestly for the faith. Verse 27. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. He says, here I met up with Sanballat's son-in-law. 
He says, therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God. Verse 30, thus cleansed I them from all strangers. And verse 31, the end of the chapter, the end of the book, so I, Nehemiah says, remember me, O my God, for good. What did he do? Old Nehemiah earnestly contended for saving the work. How does this apply to me? I really think that God is calling all of us with the influence that we have to take a bold stand for the cause of Christ, for what's right and holy and good. May God help us to earnestly contend for the faith. Will you stand up and be counted? Will you give the prime of your life the best that you have for the work of the Lord? If the answer is, eh, your heart's out of tune with God. My Bible still says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. May God help us to be earnestly contending for the faith. That's what Nehemiah did. And that's what God wants all of us to do for his glory.